All right, today we're going to be reading a story about the Titanic. So I want you to think about the background knowledge that you might already have about the Titanic, or maybe just knowledge of boats or cold water or anything like that, because you're going to need that information as we read to make connections. All right, so here we go. The RMS Titanic by Hanson Baldwin. The RMS Titanic was a giant luxury cruise ship that left Southampton, England to sail to New York in April 1912. The ship hit an iceberg and sunk. Around 1,500 people died. The following article from 1934 describes the tragedy. The author researched ships, logs, interviews, and other records to write the article. The White Star Liner Titanic, the largest ship the world had ever known, sailed from Southampton on her maiden voyage to New York on April 10, 1912. The paint on her strakes was fair and bright. She was fresh from Harland and Wolfe's Belfast Yards, strong in the strength of her 46,000 tons of steel, bent, hammered, shaped, and riveted into the three years of her slow birth. There was little fuss and fanfare at her sailing. Her sister ship, the Olympic, slightly smaller than the Titanic, had been in service for months and to ha her had gone the thunder of the cheers. But the Titanic needed no whistling streamers and shouting crowds to call attention to her superlative qualities. Her bulk dwarfed the ships near the longshoremen, singled up at her mooring lines and cast... Sorry. Her bulk dwarfed the ships near her as longshoremen singled up her mooring lines and cast off the turns of heavy rope from the bo dock bollards. She was not only the largest ship afloat, but was believed to be the safest. Carlyle, her builder, had given her double bottoms and had divided her hull into 16 watertight compartments, which made her, men thought, unsinkable. She had been built to be and had been described as a gigantic lifeboat. Her designers, dreams of the triple screw giant, a luxurious floating hotel which could speed to New York at 23 knots, had been carefully translated from blueprints and mold loft lines at the Belfast Yards into a living reality. The Titanic sailing from Southampton, though quiet, was not wholly uneventful. As the liner moved slowly toward the end of her dock that day, April day, the surge of her passing sucked away from the quay the steamer New York, more just to seaward of the Titanic's berth. There were sharp cracks as the manila mooring lines of the New York parted under the strain. The frayed ropes writhed and whistled through the air and snapped down along the waving crowd on the pier. The New York swung toward the Titanic's bow was checked and dragged back to the dock, barely in time to avert a collision. Seaman muttered, thought it was an ominous start. Past Spithead and the Isle of, of Wight, the Titanic steamed. She called at Cherbourg at dusk and then laid her course for Queenstown. At 1.30 p.m. on a Thursday, April 11th, she stood out of Queenstown Harbor, screaming gulls soaring in her wake with 2,201 persons, men, women, and children aboard. Occupying the Empire bedrooms and Georgian suites of the first-class accommodations were many well-known men and women. Colonel John Jacob Astor and his young bride, Major Archibald Butt, military aide to President Taft, and his friend Frank D. Millet, the painter, John B. Thayer, vice president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and Charles M. Hayes, President of the Grand Trunk Railway, Railway of Ch Canada, W.T. Steed, the English journalist, Jacques Futrell, the French novelist, H.B. Harris, theatrical manager, and Mrs. Harris, Mr. and Mrs. Isidore Strauss, and J. Bruce Ismay, chairman and managing director of the White Star Line. So rich people. <laughs> Down in the plain wooden cabins of the steerage class were 706 immigrants to the land of promise, and trimly stowed in the great holds was the cargo valued at $420,000. Oak beams, sponges, wines, calabashes, and an odd miscellany of the common and the rare. 
The Titanic took her departure on fastnet light and heading into the night laid her course for New York. She was due at quarantine the following Wednesday morning. Sunday dawned fair and clear. The Titanic steamed smoothly toward the west, faint streamers of brownish smoke trailing from her funnels. The purser held services in the saloon in the morning. On the steerage deck, aft the immigrants were playing games and the Scotsman was puffing the Campbells are coming on his bagpipes in the midst of the uproar. At 9 a.m., a message from the steamer, Coronia, sputtered into the wireless shack. Captain, Titanic, westbound steamers report bergs, growlers, and field ice, 42 degrees north from 49 degrees to 51 degrees west, 12th April. Compliments, Barr. It was, a cold, it was cold in the afternoon. The sun was brilliant, but the Titanic, her screws turning over at 75 revolutions per minute, was approaching the banks. In the Marconi cabin, second operator, Harold Bride, earphones clamped on his head, was figuring accounts. He did not stop to answer when he heard MLW, Continental Morse for the nearby Leylord, Leyland Liner, California, calling the Titanic. The ca sorry, the Californian. The Californian had some message about three icebergs. He didn't bother then to take it down. About 1.42 p.m., the rasping spark of those days spoke again across the water. It was the Baltic calling the Titanic, warning her of ice on the steamer track. Bride took the message down and sent it up to the bridge. The officer on the deck glanced at it, sent it to the bearded master of the Titanic, Captain E.C. Smith, a veteran of the White Star Service. It was lunchtime then. The captain, walking along the promenade deck, saw Mr. Ismay stopped and handed him the message without comment. Ismay read it and stuffed it in his pocket, told two ladies about the icebergs, and then resumed his walk. Later, about 7.15, the captain requested the return of the message in order to post it in the chat room, sorry, chart room for the information of officers. Dinner that night in the Jacobian dining room was gay. It was bitter on deck, but the night was calm and fine. The sky was moonless and studded with stars twinkling coldly in the cold, clear air. After dinner, some of the second-class passengers gathered in the saloon where Reverend Aunt Mr. Carter conducted a hymn sing-song. It was almost 10 o'clock and the stewards were waiting with biscuits and coffee as the group sang, Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. On the bridge, second officer Light Toller, short, stocky, efficient, was relieved at 10 o'clock by first officer Murdoch. Light Toller had talked with other officers about the proximity of ice. At least five wireless ice warnings had reached the ship. Lookouts had been ca cautioned to be alert. Captains and officers expected to reach the field at any time after 9.30 p.m. At 22 knots, its speed unslackened, the Titanic plowed on through the night. Light Toller left the darkened bridge to his relief and turned in. Captain Smith went to his cabin. The steerage was long since quiet. In the first and second cabins, lights were going out. Voices were growing still. People were asleep. Murdoch paced back and forth on the bridge, peering out over the dark water, glancing now and then at the compass in front of the quartermaster Hitchens at the wheel. In the crow's nest, lookout Frederick Fleet and his partner, Lee, gazed down at the water, still and unruffled in the dim, starlit darkness. Behind and below them, the ship, a white shadow with here and there a last winking light, ahead of them a dark and silent and cold ocean. There was a sudden clang. Dong dong, dong dong, dong dong, dong. The metal clapper of the great ship's bell struck out 1130. Mindful of the warnings, Fleet strained his eyes searching the darkness for the dreaded ice, but there were only stars in the sea. In the wireless room, where Phillips, the first operator, had relieved Bride, 
The buzz of the Californian set again cackled into his earphones. Californian. Say, old man, we are stuck here, surrounded by ice. Titanic. Shut up, shut up, keep out. I am talking to Cape Race. You are jamming my signals. Then, a few minutes later, about 11.40, out of the dark, she came. A vast, dim, white, monstrous shape directly in the Titanic's path. For a moment, Fleet doubted his eyes, but she was a deadly reality. This ghastly thing, frantic, Fleet struck three bells, something dead ahead. He snatched the telephone and called the bridge. Iceberg, right ahead! The first officer heard, but did not stop to acknowledge the message. Hard a starboard! Hickens strained at the wheel. The bow, bow swung slowly to port. The monster was upon them now. Murdoch leaped to the engine room telegraph. Bells clanged. Far below in the engine room, those bells struck the first warning. Danger! The indicators on the dial face swung round to stop, then full speed astern. Frantically, the engineers turned great valve wheels, answering the bridge bells. There was a slight shock, a brief scraping, and a small list to port. Shell ice, slabs and chunks of it, fell on the foredeck. Slowly, the Titanic stopped. Captain Smith hurried out of his cabin. What has the ship struck? Murdoch answered. An iceberg, sir. Sir, I heard a starboarded and reversed the engines. I hard a starboarded and reversed the engines, and I was going to hard a port around it, but she was too close. I could do no, no, I could not do any more. I have closed the watertight doors. Fourth officer, Boxhall. Other officers, the carpenter, came to the bridge. The captain sent Boxhall and the carpenter below to ascertain the damage. A few lights switched on in the first and second cabins. Sleepy passengers peered through porthole glass. Some casually asked the stewards, Why have we stopped? I don't know, sir, but I don't suppose it's anything much. In the smoking room, a quorum of gamblers and their prey were still sitting around a poker table. The usual crowd of kitbitzers looked on. They had felt the slight jar of the collision and had seen an 80-foot ice mountain glide by the smoking room windows, but the night was calm and clear and the Titanic was unsinkable. They hadn't bothered to go on deck. But far below, in the warren of passages of the starboard side forward, in the forward holes in the boiler room, men could see the Titanic's hurt was mortal. In number six boiler room, where the red glow of the furnaces lighted up the naked, sweaty chests of coal-blackened firemen, water was pouring through a great gash about two feet above the, seep, the, above the floor plates. This was no slow leak. The ship was open to the sea. In ten minutes, there were eight feet of water in number six. Long before then, the stokers had raked raked the flaming fires out of the furnaces and had scrambled through the watertight doors in number five or had climbed up the long steel ladders to safety. When Boxhall looked at the mail room in number three hold, 24 feet above the kill, the mail bags were already floating about in slushing water. In number five, boiler room of steam of stream of water spurted into an empty bunker. All six compartments forward of number four were open to the sea. In 10 seconds, the iceberg's jagged claw had ripped a 300-foot slash in the bottom of the great Titanic. All right, I'm going to stop right there, and I need you to go to the next recording.